Well, hello there, and welcome to the Arctic Reptile Ranch on this beautiful Alaska spring day. I'd like to thank you for joining me in this first episode in a series designed to introduce all of you to the members of my reptile ranch. Even though most of my videos up to now have focused on my tortoises and turtles, in this first episode, I'm going to introduce you to a critter that I've had since October 8, 1992. These are a pair of photos of my common boa constrictor, Zeus. These pictures are from just after I got them as an early birthday present nearly 25 years ago. This next photo is of how my room was throughout my junior high and high school years. That's Zeus's cage beneath my bed to the right. This series of videos will focus on introducing my reptiles and their enclosures more than be a how to care for series. As I've mentioned, I'd like to begin this series with the animal that started my journey of exotic reptile keeping, Zeus. And so, I'd like to introduce everybody to my 24 and a half year old boa, Zeus. Zeus is a Central American boa. He's a common boa constrictor, boa constrictor and parador. These guys are commonly sold in pet stores all over the country and around the world. Ugh. He is about eight feet long and weighs in the area of 15 pounds. You can see he's not exactly the fattest snake in the world. A lot of boas at this length have a lot more girth. There's two reasons for that. A lot of people tend to overfeed their snakes. But more for him is, given his age, he just doesn't want to eat as often as he used to. When he was a young, healthier snake, in his prime, we'll say, he was eating a rat every week, every two weeks. Eventually he was eating rabbits once a month. And now he's eating a rat maybe once a month he'll take it. It's probably just a function of him getting older and slowing down a bit. You can also see he's very dark for a, a common boa constrictor. You typically see this darkness in an Argentine boa and he's been mistaken for an Argentine boa quite a few times. But I assure you he's just a Central American boa constrictor. You can see some of the differences with uh, a lot of the more common boa constrictors. Instead of having the nice orange saddles back here towards the bottom, his saddles are nearly as dark as the rest of his skin is down here, outside of the saddles. His belly also has an awful lot of speckling and is really, really hyper dark here. Now, luckily, Zeus, having been with me for more than two decades now, he is a very calm, chill snake. I used to use him for shows for children when I lived in Florida and when I lived in Pennsylvania. So he's used to being out, he's used to being handled, and he's kind of used to people. While I'm not really concerned or worried that he's going to bite me, he's a snake. They're, you know, at heart wild animals, so there's always that possibility. But having had him for so long, I'm relatively confident and feel as secure as a person should around a snake that I'm not going to be hurt by him. Because a snake this side giving you a bite could be very painful. Uh, one of the reasons that he may not be quite as big as a snake at two decades normally would be is when I was younger and when I first got Zeus, I really didn't know a whole lot about exotic animals. In fact, I knew pretty much zero about exotic animals. I had kept garter snakes and DK snakes, which were native to the Philadelphia area, but I had never had an exotic animal and I didn't have any books on them. I had a little card that came in this green box that were part of a series and that's that was some knowledge of boa constrictors. I knew they got bigger and they ate mice and rats, which was a step up from the fish, frogs, and worms that I had fed to the snakes that I'd owned. So when I got him, I kept him in the same cage in the same manner that I kept garter snakes at the same temperature, which in my house was room temperature. And come to find out when I was a little bit older, maybe not too much older, that these guys need a lot more humidity and they need a lot higher temperatures than what I was used to dealing with. And part of what helped put me in that direction of knowledge understanding is having bought my first book. I'd had Zeus for maybe six months and I noticed, you know, 
the guy at the pet store told me he should be eating every five to seven days as a youngster, and he wouldn't take food but every two weeks at best. So, this right here is the very first book that I bought on exotic snakes on how to keep them. And it was a pretty good overview at the time of boas and pythons in general and how to take care of them. So I ended up learning a lot. I, again, learned that the temperature was all wrong. So I got him a better heat lamp and eventually I just raised the entire temperature in my room. The cage he was in was made of two by twos and it was screened in. So it was more or less an open air container in my, in my bedroom. So he would have a hot spot, but the air he was breathing was kind of cold, which is not good for the respiratory systems. So I just increased the temperature. So for my uh, junior high and high school years, my bedroom was at a pretty constant 85 degrees, whether it was middle of the winter or whether it was in the summertime. In the summertime, I could just open the windows and the ambient air was good enough for him. So further on into the 90s, several more books came out like this Advanced Avarium series book. TFH made a book that had all color pictures in it and was had a lot of the same information in it. And these were specifically on red-tailed boas. Now, while he's not a red-tailed boa per se, they're close enough that all the care for them is basically identical. The temperatures, the feeding, the climbing as youngsters, the amount of space they need, all that stuff was discussed in great detail about specific species. In fact, by the end of the 90s, there were these two types of books on nearly every popular pet reptile, uh, and snakes in particular. Uh, more recently, TFH has made their books like this. It, there are a lot of the same pictures, but a little bit more, more current information, and there's a lot more morphs out there color variations of these snakes that just didn't exist back in the early 90s. In fact, it wasn't until, I want to say, the mid-90s that the first albino boa was bred. Now, there's every color morph under the sun. Not quite as many as with ball pythons, but there's still quite a few, quite a few boa morphs out there. So as I got older, my interest grew from just keeping snakes and reptiles to learning about them. I wanted to know as much as I could. So I kept buying books. This is also, my fascination with books grew from the time before the internet. I couldn't just go online and check out a forum or go online and check out somebody's webpage to tell me about the animals I was keeping. I had to do the actual research, which was either buying a book or hoping to find one in a library, which was pretty much not gonna happen back then. But as I got older, I still retained my love of books and had to buy more books. So this is a book from uh, the last decade it's called The Living Boas. This is an amazing book, and it describes every snake that was known or described at the time in the boa family. So that includes boas like this, the common and red-tailed boas. It includes information on tree boas, both Amazon and emerald tree boas. It included information on the Madagascar boas, the Dumeril's boa, the ground boa, the tree boa. It also talked about sand boas and uh, the Solomon Island boas that are uh, really popular now and I was like wow this is pretty cool well then when I was searching on Amazon I found basically a textbook on the biology of boas and pythons let me see if I can get this with just one hand over here here we go so this book is exactly what you would expect from a textbook it goes in and breaks down everything almost to a, a veterinarian level on boas and pythons it talks about growth rates, talks about metabolic rates. It discusses in detail how their bodies work. Uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but all boas and pythons have heat pits in their lips, in their labial scales. Uh, when you look at a rattlesnake or a pit viper, you can see them pretty clearly. On Zeus, they're kind of small and they're really not distinct. If you ever had a emerald tree boa or if you've ever seen a uh, rainbow bow, you can see them a lot better. But it, it goes into detail about how those actually work and how they're perceived in the animal's brain. Again, if you just want to know a lot about what makes up a bow or a python, this book is I recommend it. It's, it's just great. And all of these, of course, have tons of illustrations in them. And they're fun to read and fun to look at. Or you can just do what most people do and go online to forums and try to 
learn from other people and learn from other people's mistakes. And so I'd like to thank all of you for joining me and saying hi to Zeus, the 25 year old boa constrictor who hopefully will make it to another five years to become the 30 year old boa constrictor. In my future videos, of course, I'll focus more on my turtles and tortoises because that's what I have a lot of and that's kind of what my focus is. But I've had him for so long, if I'm going to be introducing pets, I should probably introduce the pet that's been with me the longest and has had the biggest influence on my reptile keeping and my reptile keeping learning process throughout my life. So thank you for visiting the Arctic Reptile Ranch. I'll talk to you again soon and we'll introduce you to some of the tortoises.